Hello and welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective, and today I have a very interesting model for us to take a look at. And this is the IBM ThinkPad R40. Now the R40 is not the first or the last in the R two-digit series, but there is still an awful lot to talk about with this particular unit. To give you a bit of background information, the R40 was available from January of 2003 up until October of 2004. Now, if you're brand new to the R series, it was essentially a more cost-effective version of the T series. So rather than relying on magnesium chassis and kind of internal build quality to make it durable, what they decided to do was to make the device thicker and then use essentially polymers and plastics to produce uh, just as a reliable of a device. In fact, if we compare it generationally to a similar laptop, this is the T41, we can see slight differences. Now, the T41 is uh, a little thinner, especially when it starts to profile up against it. I'll illustrate that here for you in front of the camera. And the port selection on the R series sometimes actually rivaled or was better than the T series. But other than that, a lot of the functionality that you would note between these two devices is quite similar. The keyboards and navigation are essentially identical with very few differences, with the primary one, of course, being the thickness. We also have a slight difference in display setups, but we're now diving into some of the more semantical details. The bottom line is, is that the T-Series remained to be the flagship business laptop. And then the R series, which we're going to continue our focus on today, was the more budget conscious version that a lot more people could actually buy. So let's get our focus and attention back to the R40 here. There are a couple of very unique features that are worth pointing out, and I actually have a fair bit to say about this, because it is the collection of so many things that were going on at IBM during this era. First thing that I will mention is I had the opportunity to sit down with Rob Herman, who was the product manager for the R series when it was still active, and he had some excellent comments that I will splice in that are a part of a much larger interview that I did with him a little while ago. If you go back to that time, uh, you know, laptops, it was rare to see a laptop, especially from a tier one OEM that was uh, that was under a thousand dollars, right? Mm-hmm. And, but you know, it was clear from a market trend standpoint that the, the pricing was headed that way. I mean, everything back then was really led by consumer. Whatever you saw happen in consumer, uh, you were bound to see some form of that in the commercial products, especially as you looked at, you know, SMB oriented products. So, so you know, there was, there was a great deal of... Um, uh, of pressure and and uh, you know desire from from a uh, from an organizational standpoint to to participate in these these growing price points and uh, so we we really had to come up with a new product right we knew we couldn't leverage you know an X series or a T series to to do that I mean they 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 had certain attributes that uh, you know really required a certain cost point to, to reach and, and deliver those attributes. So, so, you know, we had to make some trade-offs in terms of materials. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say we were, we were aiming for cheap, uh, but, but, you know, we were trying to aim for the best value and, uh, you know, to deliver as many features as we could uh, within, uh, you know, w- w- within the brand attributes and, and reach that target price point of sub 1000. So that was really the genesis for the R series. Um, it was a net natural evolution from, from I series to, to R series. I mean, I series actually went from a consumer oriented brand to an SMB oriented brand uh, as the floppy drive went away. It was, it was actually our first uh, 14 inch two spindle system, the, uh, the ThinkPad i-series, uh, you know, it was about the third generation or fourth generation. 
And then that, that just transformed into the R series um, because we decided we needed a new letter to really represent the value it was delivering for SMBE. So, so really, you know, I mean, when you think about ThinkPad, you think about innovation uh, and constant innovation. And the innovation with our series though, was how do we deliver these great ThinkPad attributes in a sub $1,000 notebook? And, uh, you know, we, we, that, that was really the innovation that we pulled off. Uh, so, um, you know, and it really laid the groundwork for some of the, you know, uh, uh, you know, s some of the efficiencies that we have created in, in some of the other products, uh, na namely T-Series, because you look over time, you know, the T-Series really started participating in broader price points and broader cost points. And, you know, it was just based on some of the engineering uh, knowledge that we gained by doing our series and and you know, taking best practices from really everywhere to, to create the best products in every class. So as you can see, there is a bit of history uh, to go into there. And again, feel free to watch the full interview on that. In terms of the exterior function, there are two things that we do need to talk about that again, have a very interesting history. The first is that this is a dual latch laptop. And while originally dual latch laptops would be somewhat problematic because both catches needed to be operated at the same time, the latch mechanism is something that David Hill worked on uh, with his team to improve. And this, while being a dual latch system, does not require both latches to be operated at the same time. Therefore, this still remains a one hand open device. And that is really, really cool. And if you want to learn more about the latch system, you need to check out this video over here. Speaking about other videos to check out, because this is just a culmination of so much ThinkPad history in this one little device, we have a corner that has been cut off here. And as you can see, it would appear to serve no function. And you would be right. However, there was a function that was supposed to be served with this cut corner. And if you want to hear that story, which very, very few people know, even some of the most respected collectors that I have spoken to about it, did not actually know the full story. And if you want to be one of those people that gets that inside scoop, if you will, then make sure you're clicking this over here to hear David Hill talk about what exactly this was all about. The short version is it had to do with the power supply. Let's start talking a little bit about what you actually have here. Now the R40 came in two distinct flavors in terms of its size. It either came in a 13.3 inch, a 14.1 inch, or a 15 inch. Now the 13.3 and 14.1 inch came in the same chassis, whereas the 15 inch was obviously a different form factor to fit the display. These three displays would either be in the following resolution. So your 13.3 inch would be a 1024 by 768 four by three, or a 14.1 inch 1024 by 768 four by three, or your 15 inch would either be a 1024 by 768 or a step up to a 1400 by 1050 four by three display. And all of these are TFT panels. So your mileage will vary with brightness and durability. In terms of CPUs, this is where the list can get a little long and convoluted. So I will just put them up on the screen here and you can take a look for yourself. But the primary two flavors were the Intel Mobile Celeron, which had a variety of different configurations, all the way down to 1.6 gigahertz, all the way up to two gigahertz. There was a Pentium 4M, all the way down to 1.9, all the way up to 2.2. And then there was also an Education Edition Pentium M, which was a 1.3 or a 1.4 gigahertz CPU. RAM in these things officially was a maximum of one gigabyte of DDR1, I suppose, uh, 266 megahertz, PC2100. However, reports have also indicated that two one gigabyte sticks can be inserted for a grand total of two gigabytes of RAM. Your GPUs were an ATI Mobility Radeon 7000 16 megabyte or a 7500 32 megabyte card. Now, if you've seen some of my other videos, the survivability of some of those cards can vary over time. So if you are running into some boot problems or display problems, 
the ATI card sometimes can be the culprit. And unfortunately, in models like this, where there is no integrated GPU, you're going to be out of luck. One other claim to fame that the R40 should be known for is actually having to do with the track point cap. This was the very first machine that IBM shipped, not only with the soft uh, dome cap that we have today on all of our ThinkPads, but three caps were included in a little baggie, uh, essentially stapled to the bottom of the box. And if you want to know more about the history of the track point cap development, you better believe that I have a video about that straight from the source. So if you want to hear David Hill tell that story, right up there. And you can hear the fantastic story about the development of this little guy right there. Let me give you a quick tour of some of the ports and features of the laptop. We do have a ThinkLite present on this model. However, there is no webcam or microphone array. That was kind of before their time at this price point especially. If we take a look at the left-hand side, we have a headphone and microphone jack, USB, and we do have FireWire, which was not available on all of these computers. Over here, we do have a card bus. Along the back, we have our power plug, parallel printer, VGA, our 56K modem, Ethernet, another USB 2.0, and then your PS2 plug for your keyboards and your mice. And then over here we have a Ultra Bay, and this is actually the full real deal Ultra Bay. So we can actually eject this, which is fantastic. You got either a CD, DVD, uh, rewritable combo drive, or just a CD drive. And if we take a look in there, which is really hard to see, there is actually compatibility in there for the uh, Ultra Bay battery. So you can install a battery in here, you can install an optical drive. So there was a fair degree of expandability even in the Ultra Bay itself, which is a great thing to see on what was supposed to be a very budget machine. And then on the bottom, we have ourselves a dock connector. And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments. So now that I've given you the port tour and this thing is upside down, we should probably talk about the disassembly of the machine. And this machine is actually a pretty decent example in terms of its cleanliness. So with our trusted screwdriver, let's go ahead and begin. Removal of the battery is simply removing the tab and pivoting the battery out. There is only one battery available for these, and it is an eight cell battery. According to the PS Ref guide that was available from IBM, the 13 inch model was about 3.8 hours, the 14 inch model was about 3.8 to 4 hours, and the 15 inch model would be about 3.4 to 3.6 hours, depending on usage. The next thing we can do is remove this little drawer right here, which gives us access to our Wi Fi card. And of course, we are in the era of big, massive Wi-Fi cards. So that's the only thing that we're going to see there. If we move over to this next bay and spin out these two screws, we can see both of our RAM slots staring us in the face. And we can see that this machine has been fully upgraded beyond spec because we have a one gigabyte module here, 256 megabyte module here. So it's not fully spec'd out at two gigs, but it is definitely over spec over the minimum one gig. So it's not going to be the slowest thing in the world, won't be the fastest either, somewhere in a happy medium middle ground. The next major component that we would obviously want to remove is the hard drive enclosure. And we'll do that by spinning out the screw over here and trying not to drop that on the floor. With that screw removed, we just give that a good hard yank. And this is a Travel Star Hitachi hard disk drive, 40 gigabytes. With that out of the way, the next thing that we can do is remove the keyboard. And thank goodness we have pictograms to tell us which screws need to be removed. So this one needs to be removed. And this one needs to be removed. We grab a plastic pry tool. Got two clips there. One clip there, there we go. 
All right, we got a big fat ribbon to disconnect. We can see essentially all of the little shielding. We can see a CMOS battery, which has seen much better days and is needed to be replaced. Uh, access to the fan, the heat sink, and it would appear that we have a socketed CPU under there. So we could upgrade this to any CPU supported by the board. So as you can see, the R series is no slouch. And it's actually a really cool device to see because is it built cheaper than a T-Series? Absolutely, no question about it. But just because it's built cheaper than its mainline brothers doesn't mean that it's any less of a ThinkPad or any less cool. And I think that extends to some of the current lines too, although I haven't had too much experience with those, but I have heard through the grapevine that the L-Series remains highly upgradable, and in some cases, more upgradable than the current T-Series. That tangent aside though, that is pretty much the main serviceable components. We can, we can remove the remaining screws, remove the top, and gain further access if we need to. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna put all of this back together and I'm gonna show you one more thing before we turn it on. Now that we have this whole thing back together, it's a matter of powering it on. Now the battery in this is pretty flat, so we have a few options available to us to actually get it started up. We do obviously have our AC adapter, which is the smaller barrel plug style that we would see on the older ThinkPads. And we could obviously plug that in and power it on, and that would work perfectly fine. However, we have opportunities every once in a while here, so we're going to put this off to the side. Because what we're going to need for a power supply is this. So this is the AC adapter that accompanies this little piece of kit. And this is what we're going to be using in conjunction with this ThinkPad today. And of course, this is a port replicator. Now this port replicator is very much uh, a simplistic port replicator in the sense that it has some bells and whistles on the back here, uh, but by and large, that's really all you get. So for this port replicator, we replicate the modem, ethernet, VGA, but we're given DVI, four USB ports, air, two audio plugs, that's your power, which is a very unique plug, two different uh, peripheral connections for mouse and keyboard, parallel, serial, and this was a special port for all sorts of different connectivity. So let's go ahead and take a few seconds to get everything set up. All right, now that we have everything plugged in and ready to go, Let's go ahead and open this up and I'm going to press the power button behind. All right, now that we have this thing booted, which does take a little bit just because of that CMOS battery being toast, we are running Windows XP and it's pretty clear that the person that owned this before me was quite the gamer. We've got everything from Age of Empires to Sim Tower, Ultima 7, Morrowind, and interestingly enough, a copy of Command and Conquer on here. Well, folks, as we kind of wrap up our look at this, we can see that this is the Pentium 4 2 gigahertz model, so not too shabby. And honestly, you can use it as a retro machine, and it'll do all sorts of mid-level games. And of course, it will make a great DOS box machine if you're looking for something like that. But to me, this is really a culmination of history. There is so much going on with the R40 that was indicative of that specific time period at IBM, that this is truly a time capsule of so many different innovations and features. To the cut corner, to the one-handed latch, to the track point caps, there's just so much here. And I think that's one of the reasons why I appreciate it so much is because of so many things that truly make this ThinkPad a ThinkPad, even down to the inclusion, of course, of the ThinkLite. Obviously, the ThinkLite on this one isn't as bright as some of the other ones that we've seen, but needless to say, it is a worthwhile inclusion. At any rate, ladies and gentlemen, I hope very much that you have enjoyed this fantastic machine as much as I have. It's 
it's just there's so much history here to talk about and I hope that you've enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it and you would like to see more like this video, then I would encourage you to do the big four so you don't miss any of the other machines that I feature on this channel. Please like the video, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so the next time I feature a laptop like this that has so many stories to tell, you'll be the first to know about it. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time.